Welcome to lecture one on the science of psychology. I want you to think about how different psychology can be in terms of all of its many facets. That is, there are psychologists all over the world who do all sorts of different things. So we have our therapists out there, of course, but there are psychologists who study different research questions, there are psychologists who work at universities, there are psychologists who work in organizations or maybe in sport. It's just many different kinds of psychologists. So psychology is really multifaceted. To show you how different psychology can be, I just want to highlight three organizations that psychologists can belong to. The first one here is the American Psychological Association. It's actually the largest psychology organization in the world. In fact, it's one of the largest professional societies in the world. It has more than 122,000 members. So you can see there's the APA. Lots of different kinds of psychologists. This particular webpage is focusing on gerontology and how psychology could contribute to helping understand geropsychology. The American Psychological Association is so vast that it's actually made up of smaller divisions and you can belong to any of these other divisions as you want and they all have their own journals and conferences and so on. So you can see for instance that there's Society Number 12 which is the Society of Clinical Psychology. You have the Psychologists in Public Service, number 18. There's the Society for the History of Psychology, number 26. Or down at 35, we have the Society for the Psychology of Women. So lots of different interests in psychology. These could reflect professional issues where somebody might be delivering services based on one of these topics, or they're just interested in it from a research point of view. Like I said, many different ways to go. And there are actually 54 divisions of the American Psychological Association. Another international society for psychology is the Association for Psychological Science. And this one has more than 35,000 leading psychological scientists, academics, clinicians, researchers, educators, administrators, and students from more than 80 countries. So this is a very international organization. And you can see from their website there some of the topics that they might be focused in and there are just a variety of different things that the Association for Psychological Science gets involved with. So that's one APS. And there's another APS here in Australia, the Australian Psychological Society. It's the largest professional society for psychologists in Australia. And it has over 27,000 members. So it in itself is very large. And there are many psychologists all over the country doing all sorts of different things. And it says here on their webpage, the functions of the Australian Psychological Society are conducted through the National Office in Melbourne with a staff of over 110 people. And you can see there are 40 branches spread across Australia, nine APS colleges representing specialty areas like clinical neuropsychology, clinical psychology, community psychology, and so on, as well as 41 interest groups that represent the wide range of special interests of the APS membership. The last thing I just want to show you is just the breadth of psychology journals we have. We have a couple hundred psychology journals that are out there, and these are just some of the many different topics that are covered by psychology research journals. So you could do work on the psychology of music, journal of child psychology, you could be interested in political psychology. Again, wide variety of topics. So as I'm trying to demonstrate here, psychology is multifaceted. So when you say you've met a psychologist, you really don't know that much because there's so many different ways that psychology could be represented by a person. So when you think about how varied and different psychology can be from one place to another, then the question might be, what unifies psychology? What puts us all together and says, we are psychologists, but what do we do? Well, I would say it's because we have this general quest to understand behavior using the methods of science. So we've decided collectively, when we call ourselves psychologists, that we're gonna use science to understand the questions of behavior in the mind that we might be interested in. And so this course is really an introduction to these methods of science that we use in psychology. And I want to just take some more time here at this first lecture, talk a little bit more about what science is itself. So to understand what science is, I want you to not think of it just as a bunch of facts or a pile of knowledge that we have out there. It's not just this accumulation of things that you need to get stuck into your head. I want you to think instead about science as being a process for acquiring the knowledge that we have about the world. And when you think about what that means, a process for acquiring the knowledge about the world, let's think about two alternatives that could be out there for learning about the world that are not science. So alternative to science number one 
would be your personal experience, things that just happened to you that you or have happened throughout the course of your life. And so you could say, I understand the way people work because I've observed people in different situations. I understand what works in terms of giving people compliments, whatever it is. You have some basic idea about how you think the world works in terms of people and their behavior. But let's go ahead and just look at a little bit about the fact that one of the problems with this by using personal experience is that we have a tendency then to fall prey to what's called confirmation bias. That is, we think we know a lot more than we do because we have a tendency to search for things that confirm what we already believe. And that's what we think is going to make us feel like we're right. So for example, I'm going to show you three numbers, two, four, and six. And a psychologist named Wayson back in 1960 did this in an experiment. He showed people these numbers, two, four, six. And then he asked them to generate another set of three numbers according to the same rule that came up with two, four, and six. Okay, so he says, what other combinations could fit this rule? Tell me what else would happen for the other three numbers. And so then you can look to see what participants come up with for their different things. They might say 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, or they might say 2, 4, 6, 20, 40, 60. And they try different things, right? So they come up with some what they think is the rule for these three numbers when they come up with their, their own particular rule. But it turns out that the actual rule that Wayson had come up with when he did this was just three numbers in ascending order. That it could be any three numbers where the number next number is bigger than this, the number that happened before it. So it could be 246, 789, 246, 11, 13, 25. All of those would have fit the rule. And so the reason why I bring all that up, what Wayson was trying to show is that when he then told people what his rule was, participants then said, oh, of course, that's the rule. That's what I thought all along. And so people hear that rule and they think, yeah, that's of course what the rule is. And that's what they think they, they would have said is the rule, but it's not really what you know necessarily they would have predicted. So that's why this is confirmation bias. It's this tendency for people to search for confirmation of what they already believe. And so they might have generated their own rules, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, because they think they know what the rule is to come up with 8, 10, 12. Or when they hear what the actual rule is, they say, oh yeah, of course, I knew that all along. Either of those things is confirmation bias. And see, what that does is it gives us from our own personal experience a lot of confidence that we always think we know what's going on, that we understand it. And then so as an alternative to science, it's not the best way for us to actually learn about human behavior as psychologists. So another alternative would be to science is just use the method of authority, which is we just go ahead and let people who are experts tell us everything. So they write a great self-help book or they have a textbook or whatever it happens to be. They have a famous professor who just tells you everything you need to know and you listen to what I say and you make notes of it and you study it. And so therefore you now become an expert on psychology. But the problem with that is that you don't really know if my knowledge is always going to be accurate. I might be flawed. I might be giving you wrong information. We might not know that the authority figure really isn't an expert, doesn't really know about that. And it also has just the problem that a lot of the things that an authority figure says isn't directly verifiable. Sure, it's a way for us to know about the world, to hear things from authorities, but it's not science. That's not the way that we want to learn about how humans work is just by listening to experts tell us what it is that makes people work. Again, I'm not trying to say that the personal experience and the method of authority don't have their value, but they're certainly not science in themselves, okay? So let's go back to saying what science actually is. And in order to think a little bit more about what science actually is, I want you to consider the work of a very famous quote unquote psychologist. And that psychologist is one that you probably heard about back when you were in high school, and that's Sigmund Freud. So Sigmund Freud is probably our most famous psychologist, even though he actually specifically wasn't a psychologist. He was more of a medical doctor or a neurologist. He was born back in 1856. He moved to Vienna, Austria in 1860. He stayed there until he was 19, and still until the 1930s, till 1938, when the Nazis came into Austria. He was the eldest of eight children, and his the eldest of eight children of his father's third wife. But he ended up studying medicine, being a brilliant student, and went off to the University of Vienna, and like I said, specialized in neurology. 
He married Martha Bernays, who in this picture, and he also went off to Paris for a year and learned a lot about neurology from a famous neurologist there named Charcot. And he came back to Vienna after that year, and he stayed there and set up his practice until he had to flee Austria in World War II. He then ended up moving to a London suburb called Hampstead, and he stayed there until he died in 1939. So that's just a brief biography of who Sigmund Freud is, but let's talk a little bit more about his training and his approach to psychology. You could say there are four major influences on Freud's thinking. First of all, it's he was trained as a doctor, so he was medically trained, which meant that he had a certain way of observing cases, making judgments about what might be wrong, and then prescribing some sort of treatment, which is what part of the essence of medical training is. He also was very influenced by the theory of evolution, which was all the rage in the late 19th century because of Darwin's origin of species. And he himself, Freud, thought of himself as being a follower of the theory of evolution. He was also very much influenced by work that was going on in the late 19th century unconsciousness and about how we might be aware of a lot of our thoughts, but then again, also have things that are not necessarily things we could be aware of. And so he was really interested in philo philosophical discussions about what consciousness was. And finally, he was very much interested in the natural sciences. He was interested in physics, chemistry, all of these advances that were happening around the same time, like Einstein and physics and things that we were learning about biology. All of these would have been things that have influenced on Freud's thinking when he developed his own theories about psychology. I want to just point out to you, if you're really interested in Freud, there are two museums in the world that specialize in understanding more about Freud. One of them is back in Vienna, where he had his original apartment. There isn't a whole lot left that's there, because I remember I told you that he had to flee Vienna in 1938 and go off to London. So he took most of his possessions with him, but they have some of his possessions there in Vienna, and you can actually tour that apartment and see it. But you can also go to Hampstead in one of these suburbs of London. And Hampstead actually has his final home and most of his belongings are there, including his office and his sofa. And I was just there in 2019 and it's a really fantastic place to visit. You can see uh, things like the prescriptions for the different things that he needed to take as he became ill. You can see all of his books that he owned, his pictures, his collections of artifacts that he liked to get as he traveled around the world. And also people would send him different kinds of ancient artifacts that he had in cases around his desk. That's his desk in the lower right corner. His glasses are actually still sitting on some of his papers there. That's his famous couch or the sofa where he would have his clients or his patients lie down. And then that green chair off to the left there is where he would sit during the therapy session. That picture that you see up on the wall above the couch is Charcot, that neurologist in Paris that Freud had learned neurology from and also learned about hypnosis from. So anyway, it's all there in Hampstead, and I just wanted to put that little aside there that if you ever get to travel to London, you might think about visiting this, go spend a few hours out at the Freud Museum. Now, the other things that Freud are famous for are things like the Oedipus Complex, and I'm not really going to get into what the Oedipus Complex is, but basically it's inspired by a, the, a Greek tragedy that by Sophocles written in 429 BC, and Freud was really moved by this play, and he thought that perhaps it explained a lot about his own relationships with his mother and boys growing up in terms of their attraction to their mothers and so on, so that became part of his theorizing. He also is the person who introduced the id, the ego, and the superego, and he talked about these three structures, and the id was the oldest and the most primitive, and then you have the ego, and then the superego. None of this you need to know for this particular course. I just wanted to refresh any memory that you might have about Freud, and you might cover Freud later on in your studies in psychology. But these are the kinds of things that Freud wrote about over the many decades that he contributed to his psychology. So there he is, Freud, uh, near the end of his life in his Hampstead office. Now, the thing about Freud is that even though he's so famous and we think of him as our quintessential psychologist, Freud isn't really considered scientific today. So most of the mainstream psychology people will tell you that Freud's theories, his ideas are unscientific. So even though Freud called them scientific theories, we today consider these theories to be unscientific. And so to understand then why Freud's theories are unscientific, I thought this would help us understand then what science is and what a science of psychology is 
in the 21st century. So I think of psychology as having, or science of psychology as having five modern ingredients, and by modern, like in the last couple centuries. Okay, so these five modern ingredients, ingredients in science is our empiricism, materialism, positivism, logical positivism, and operationism. And these don't all happen at the same time. They evolve slowly over the, as psychology became its own science. But let's go ahead and look at what each of these five ingredients are. So start with empiricism. It's probably the oldest ingredient in what makes up science, and especially the science of psychology. It goes back to empiricist philosophers who were really interested in trying to understand where knowledge came from. And they argue that all knowledge is derived from sensory experience. So they thought that the way we know about the world comes through our senses. And therefore, if you want to understand the world, you need to be as objective as you can and just look out there into the world and let things come in through your senses and you'll understand it. Reason really took a back seat when I mean, you learned about the world. So you don't use like deductive reasoning to try to explain the things that you're, you're observing with empiricism empiricism. Instead, the emphasis here, if you're an empiricist, is that you make observations first, and then you could draw conclusions, which is called inductive reasoning. So deductive reasoning would be when you have a theory or a hypothesis you start with, and then you try to find evidence for it. Empiricists say, start with the observations first. Start with a bunch of facts, things that you observe about what people do and then draw conclusions, come up with a theory, some sort of explanation, and then that would be inductive reasoning, all right? So this is actually something that's been around for several centuries, empiricism, and it certainly underlies the way we do psychology today as a science. The second ingredient that I think is important to bring up is the idea of materialism. And the idea of materialism is that all the facts of the universe can be described in physical terms, and explained by the nature and physical properties of matter and energy. So it's saying that everything that science covers is gonna be described in physical terms and can be explained by the nature and physical properties of matter and energy. So everything has some actual basis that we can measure or basically there's some physical property to it. And even human consciousness then can be explained then by anatomical and physiology of the brain. So we're not going to things talk about things like a soul or a ghost or something that's metaphysical to try to explain things in psychology. Instead, we focus on things that are physical that we can explain from like aspects of nature. And so human consciousness is also then explained by anatomical and physiology of the brain. Even Freud, even just, I, I, I talked about like the id and the ego and the superego. Freud thought of himself as a materialist. So he thought that everything could be reduced down to some sort of physical properties of the brain. He just didn't know at the time of his doing his work what those parts of the brain would be. But he thought ultimately, psychology is going to move to a point where we can explain things like the id, the ego, and the superego by knowing exactly what the physical properties of those things would be. Now, the third component here for our modern science of psychology is what's known as positivism. All right. Now, positivism is something that happens later than empiricism, and it's usually associated with this fellow here, Auguste Comte, who lived in France, and he really believed in like empiricism, but his brand of empiricism was even stronger. So he talked about positive knowledge is the result of objective observations using systematic methods of science by unbiased observers. So the way we get knowledge is like empiricism. It's through objective observation through our senses, but you use systematic methods of science with unbiased observers to collect that knowledge, right? So it means that you're going to have a set ways of doing things. Like there's going to be set ways that we measure the waves of a particle or the way that, si that a human behaves that there are observe, objective observations using these systematic methods of science, and the observer's supposed to be unbiased. And just to throw in that idea again against material, for materialism, metaphysical speculation is considered worthless. So we're not gonna try to talk about things that we can't observe. There's also a lot of premium put on practical knowledge. So positivism as a part of science was that we should be trying to think about 
how we can take this information that we're getting from our senses in a systematic way and turn it into something practical. So Comte and his followers really valued practical knowledge, believing that there was this intimate connection between understanding nature and controlling it. So you could understand exactly how trees grew or people behaved, and then you could control it because you have that knowledge. So he, in fact, argued that the ability to control nature was evidence that it was understood. That if you could, for instance, create an effective steam engine, that meant you really understood a lot of different principles of physics in order to make that steam engine. So his faith in science even led him to believe, recommend that we should deliberately redesign society once we knew more about the control of behavior and the way people worked. So he really started this sort of idea that psychology then took on in the 20th century, where we could take practical information from the way that we behave and try to turn it back to the way kids can learn in school, the way society should be set up, and so on. So his leadership in terms of this sort of these, again, he was just a philosopher, but because of his beliefs about the way things should be known, got to be to a point where he talked about science which was that he thought we needed to, as a society, get rid of religion and have science be at the basis of everything. So that's what positivism is. It's really this empiricism 2.0. It's really taking it one step further and really showing how we can use systematic methods of observation to have value and give us practical knowledge. Again, going back to Freud, Freud considered himself to be a positivist. In fact, he even wrote something similar about getting rid of religion in 1933. Here's just a little quote, and it might be a little dense, but he says, it's not permissible to declare that science is one field of human mental activity and that religion and philosophy are others, at least equal in value, and that science has no business to interfere with the other two, that they all have equal claim to be true and that everyone is at liberty to choose from which he will draw his convictions and in which he will place his belief. A view of this kind is regarded as particularly superior, tolerant, broad-minded, and free from liberal prejudices. Unfortunately, it is not tenable. It's simply a fact that the truth cannot be tolerant, that it admits no compromises or limitations, that research regards every sphere of human activity as belonging to it, and that it must be relentlessly critical if any other power tries to take over any other part of it. So you can see what he's saying here is that religion and philosophy cannot be held up as equal to science. Science is going to give us what the truth is, and therefore if that that truth goes against what philosophy or religion is saying, you can't keep holding on to religion and philosophy. So that's why we consider Freud to even be a positivist. He's already got three of those elements of modern science, right? He's, He's got empiricism, he observes his patients, he is a materialist. He doesn't believe that there's any kind of soul or something metaphysical out there. And he's a positivist. As I said, it looks like Freud could be considered a scientist by our modern definitions, right? But there are still these other two ingredients. And this is where Freud starts to fall down. So as we move on into the sort of history of science, we get into what's called logical positivism. And this is something that arose in the 1920s and 1930s in Vienna, Austria. So this, there was a group of physicists, logicians, and mathematicians in Vienna, and they called themselves the Vienna Circle. And what they wanted to do was work together as physicists, logicians, mathematicians to formulate general principles of gathering knowledge, particularly by taking lessons from successful sciences like chemistry and physics. So they had this goal of having a unified science one in which the language of science would rest a lot on the use of symbols to eliminate the problems that come from natural language. So for decades, they really talked philosophically about what makes good science. And they said that science has two features. According to them, it's empiricist and positivist. So there's two of those three elements that I just mentioned. So they believe in empiricism and they believe in positivism. But they also say that it uses logical analysis or reason. So this is something new. So they're saying that you can use logic to tie together some of the things that come from empiricism and positivism. You can use good logic to make deductions about things, given the fact that we already have some evidence. So that's why logic and logical analysis is going to be important. You say there are two different kinds of logical statements you could have about your experiences that come from empiricism and positivism. And some of those logical statements are statements that are reducible to simpler statements. So you could take something that it might describe the way that you perceive 
music and then maybe reduce it to simpler statements about how you can perceive individual notes or the melody or whatever it happens to be. So the idea is that there's logical statements that can be made about different things that we observe in our experiences. But they also said that there are other statements that cannot be reduced about the experience. And then these become devoid of meaning. And these would be metaphysical explanations. So this is where we run into the limitations of science. So we get to a point where we come up with statements that we just don't really understand what the phenomenon is. They're not going to be relevant. They're not going to be useful for us in science and psychology. So metaphysical explanations are not going to be accepted by logical positivists. Give you an example of a specific person who really took on psychology, and that's Karl Popper. Karl Popper was part of this Vienna Circle, but he never actually was really a member of it. He frequently communicated with those people in the Vienna Circle. In fact, he was born and raised in Vienna. His parents were good friends with one of Freud's sisters. He went to the University of Vienna. He attended lectures in math, physics, philosophy, psychology, and so on. He even worked for one of Freud's followers, Alfred Adler. So he had a lot of contact with psychologists. And in fact, in 1928, he earned a doctorate in psychology. But because he and his wife were Jewish, they had to flee Vienna in 1934. He first went to the UK, and then he ended up in Canterbury University in Christchurch in New Zealand in 1936. He was there until after the war, and then in 1946, he moved to, back to the UK and was at the London School of Economics and at the University of London. So that's a little bit about his background. Now, the thing about Karl Popper was that he didn't really believe much in theories. He thought theories shouldn't have a whole lot of value in science, that theories were too conjectural, too hypothetical, and it would be very hard to have a good theory that you could test with experiments and so on. He just didn't have a lot of emphasis on them. He'd rather stay focused on observations and making, getting more and more data. The other problem that he thought was that a lot of theories were not falsifiable. That means that you can't come up with a way to ever turn out that the theory was wrong. And so falsifiability to him was the difference between what was and is was not genuinely scientific. So if you had a theory in which there was no way you could do an experiment to show that the theory was wrong, then it wasn't a scientific theory to him. A really good theory would be like Einstein's theory, that even though it seemed really almost impossible at the time that Einstein proposed the ideas that he had, Eventually, some people were able to do experiments to show support that Einstein was actually correct. The problem, he thought, was that Freud's theories were not falsifiable. That in fact, that they were too broad of an explanation of human behavior, and they were basically designed to refute any criticism you might have about the theory. So to talk about things like the id, the ego, and the superego were just such broad explanations that how would you ever show that there, we didn't have an id, an ego, or a superego, or that the Oedipus complex was complete garbage. That is, the theories themselves don't act, are just too broad and expansive. They're the worst kind of theory to Popper. And so therefore, he didn't think Freud was scientific because his theories weren't falsifiable. So that is about the time that you start to hear more criticism of Freud as being not a real scientist because he has theories that are not falsifiable. So let's move to that final important element in the science of psychology, and that's called operationism. Of those logical positivists that I mentioned, like the Vienna Circle, one of those people who spent a lot of time talking about psychology was a guy named Rudolf Carnap. And he believed that all psychological concepts should ultimately refer to publicly observable occurrences. So he said, if we're gonna really be a science, you have to take every concept that you're interested in and figure out a way that you could observe it, that it could be measured or be looked at. And further taking this was another one of these logical positives guy named Percy Bridgman, who was actually a physicist. And he coined this term operationism, in which the investigator must, specific, must specify how any concept is to be measured that you need to give its operational definition. So the idea here is that if I have a concept like hunger, that sounds like I'm saying the animal is hungry or the human is hungry, I need to find out a way that I can publicly observe what hunger is. How can I actually measure hunger? And for instance, a behaviorist like Skinner or other researchers that worked with rats might say, hunger is defined by the number of hours since the last meal. So if you've deprived the animal of 
food for 12 hours, you could say that it must be pretty hungry. The hunger level is pretty high because it's been 12 hours since its last meal. So you see, there's something you can publicly observe, like the amount of time that's happened since the last meal, then to define what hunger is. Or maybe you have some physiological measure of hunger, like how much sounds the stomach makes or something like that. That's again where Freud had a problem. It was very hard to come up with operational definitions of Freud's ideas. B.F. Skinner, a really famous psychologist, wrote, Freud appears never to have considered the possibility of bringing the concepts and theories of psychological science into contact with the rest of physical and biological science by the simple expedient of an operational analysis of terms. So even though Freud believed he was a materialist, that it was all physical and biological, he didn't actually ever come up with any operational definitions for his concepts that you could then measure in the brain or measure in whatever it was. Now, the psychoanalysts like Freud would come back and say, that's because the things that we're studying are so complex right now, we don't have any way we can do that. It would oversimplify things. But the point is that this kind of steady criticism of Freud, that he couldn't come up with operational definitions, is part of the reason then why academic psychology soon lost interest in Freud and Freud's ideas and his theories. So you can say, that in the 20th century, we get this rise of logical positivism, where we got empiricism with rational thinking and methods that we're going to agree on, and operationism, where we can have operational definitions of the things we're interested in psychology. So academic psychology just loses interest in psychoanalysis and Freud as a result. One more important thing I want to bring up here before we go back to the main points of today's lecture, and that's just to mention one other psychologist you probably have never heard of, a guy named James Broadus Watson, John, oh, sorry, John Broadus Watson, John, J.B. Watson is his name. John Watson lived in the early part of the 20th century. He was hired as a full professor in 1907 at Johns Hopkins University at the age of 29. And just like a luck of fate, things happened in the next year, and when he was turning 30, where he just happened to become the head of the department and took over editing and, lead, and owning and running the leading psychology journal. The thing about Watson, was that he was a logical positivist and really believed in operationism and really wanted psychology to follow that new model, to, to get rid of the stuff that like Freud was doing and make it all operational definitions. And he called his brand of psychology behaviorism. And in his way that he could control things now at this young age of 30, and he has this leading psychology journal, he ends up writing an important paper in 1913 called Psychology as the Behaviorist Views It. And here's a little excerpt from it, like a manifesto about what psychology is. He says, psychology as the behaviorist views it is a purely objective, natural science. Its theoretical goal is the prediction and control of behavior. Introspection forms no essential part of its methods, nor is the scientific value of its data dependent upon the readiness with which they lend themselves to interpretation in terms of consciousness. The behaviorist, in his attempts to get a unitary scheme of animal response, recognizes no dividing line between man and man. The behavior of man with all of its refinement and complexity forms only a part of the behaviorist's total scheme of investigation. So one of the things he's saying there is that you can actually study non-human animals and also understand psychology. So what this declaration of independence from traditional psychology, the way Freud and others might have been doing it, is he's saying, first of all, psychology must be completely objective and rule out all subjective data or interpretations. So for a long time there, we got rid of things like self-reports. We didn't ask people what they thought because that wasn't considered completely objective. Instead, we focused on behavior and measuring action times and the way that people looked at things and so on. Secondly, another thing that's important about his manifesto is he's saying that psychology's goal is not to describe and explain consciousness, but to predict and control behavior. This goes back to Comte's idea that once you understand something, you should be able to control it. So if we really understand, for instance, like why some children end up misbehaving and others don't, then we should be able to control that kind of behavior and prevent kids from ever misbehaving again. And finally, he denies the traditional psychological distinction between humans and others, and he says that we should be studying apes, rats, pigeons, and even flatworms because of the continuity of life, and this has to do again with evolution. So this might all seem long ago, really, it's like over 100 years ago now, 110-ish years ago, that we have these kind of manifestos and so going on. But why I bring it all up now is just to make sure that you understand that 
The way that we do psychology as a science today was something that evolved over several decades, over a couple hundred years in fact. And what we call psychology today is because we, the way we do our science today is because we've agreed upon all of these things that sort of came online over the decades. And so now you understand a little bit more about the origins of these things and why we call psychology a science and why we focus so much on the methods that we happen to use. Let's move and talk a little bit about some of the principles of science. And so these kind of come from what I just talked about. So if I'm going to talk about the principles of science from the perspective of psychology, we can talk about empiricism again. So this is this evidence that we get that's objective and observable. One thing I haven't really said too much about is skepticism, but the idea behind scientists is that we tend to be skeptical. We want to have evidence and we therefore also look at how good the evidence is. Another aspect of science is openness. And openness is the idea that we're always going to be open to new data, alternative explanations for what we are doing. Because we don't get too fixed on something, we might be wrong. And so we need to be open to new pieces of information. Tentativeness is related to this. The idea of tentativeness is that we never speak with firmness about our conclusions. You'll always hear us hedge things a little bit. We'll say, we're fairly certain, we have a high probability that we think we're correct about this, but we're not gonna be absolute and 100% and say something has been proven. So tentativeness is another principle of science. And finally, there's an independence from authority. That is, we tend not to want to have authority figures tell us the way things are. We instead wanna collect the data in the ways that we use in empiricism and through positivism, and try to keep ourselves from being influenced by authority figures. All right, so those are some of the principles that you can see from the, the information I've just presented to you. So then let's talk a little bit about the goals of science, and this kind of reflects well with some of the things that Watson wrote about. And so one of our goals of science and psychology is to describe. So we want to describe what we actually see, collect information and describe it the best we can. And then the next step is we often want to explain it. So we collect a lot of information, we make a lot of observations, and then we try to explain it. We come up with a theory, some models, some scientific explanation for it. And then we try to make predictions about it. So we then say, I wonder how well we understand this. And you remember what Comte said, that if you really understood something, you should be able to control it. And therefore you should also be able to predict it. So you want to predict and make a prediction, go out and test it. And if you're correct, then you seem to really understand the phenomenon. If you're not correct, your prediction's not upheld, then you need to go back and work on that explanation some more. And then finally, control again would be that you could then take what you've learned and be able to use that information to control things. Maybe develop better policies, better ads, better ways to get people to take vaccines, whatever it happens to be. This next slide shows you what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, the kind of the big picture of it all and how it all fits in. We're going to talk more about theory. So even though people like Popper believe that theory was not the best way to do things, we still do rely a lot on theory. So we're going to talk about theories. You also see that in the book. And then theories give us our predictions or hypotheses that we like to then test. We tend to look at two different hypotheses at the same time we tend to talk about what's called the null hypothesis. And this is when we are making a statement about something that we're observing, where we say there's no relationship between the couple of variables that we're interested in. So we might say that there's no relationship between the memorability of the names and the perception of names. And then we'll use statistics to help us figure out what are the odds that these results would occur by chance. And what we ultimately want to do is try to reject null hypotheses statements about the relationships between variables where there's no relationship. Because what we really want to do is try to show that there is relationships between variables. We'll get more into this in the next few weeks, but this is a really a major part of the way that we do psychology statistical testing, is to think about this, the hypotheses, these null and alternative hypotheses. Again, don't worry about it right now if you don't really understand what this is, but I'm just giving you a heads up that in the next couple of weeks, we're really going to be talking much more about hypotheses.
There's also the whole aspect of how to design our studies. And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about two major ways you could think about designing a study. One major way is to use experiments. Another way is to use surveys. So research design is really the foundation of your study. And if you don't really do a good job of designing your study, you're going to have a problem then making your conclusions. So this kind of goes to that part of positivism or logical positivism, where we're going to talk about things like our operational definitions. We're going to make sure that our methods are things that other people could also follow and use. We're going to be talking about variables, things like the independent variable. And the independent variable is the variable that we independently manipulate in an experiment. So I would go ahead and take this variable and say it's the complexity of a maze for rats, or it's the number of bystanders that are around who could possibly help in a study. It's something that I as the experimenter can control in the experiment. It's also sometimes called a factor or an explanatory variable, or even a predictor variable in some kinds of designs. And independent variables, or IVs, have levels associated with them. You'll get more practice about this at the workshops, and we're certainly going to be talking more about independent variables again in the next couple weeks. The other kind of variable that's really important is the dependent variable. And the dependent variable is a measure of some attribute, characteristic, or behavior that we think comes from changes in the IV, so the independent variable, or maybe they're related to changes in another DV, another dependent variable. And the reason why it's called a dependent variable is that the DV is dependent on the values of some other variables. So they're not independently controlled by the experimenter. They're somehow being affected by the experimenter, either through changes in an ID or changes from another dependent variable. So when we go back to hypothesis testing, what we're really saying is that there's no effect, no relationship between the IV and the DV in the null hypothesis, or in the research hypothesis, we're saying that there is a relationship between the IV and the DV. So again, don't worry too much right now if you don't understand what this means, the null and the research hypothesis. I just want to give you a flavor of how we're going to start putting all of this together in the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to go out and collect our data. And so we're going to have, we're going to conduct our study. We're going to organize, organize display, and understand our data using descriptive statistics. And then we're going to go ahead and do some statistical tests that are called inferential statistical tests to help us analyze our data. And we take all that information and we end up writing a report. Okay? And we write our report and we decide whether or not we're going to repeat the experiments, whether or not we have evidence for our theory and so on. Now, as we talk about theories and hypotheses, remember that stuff that Popper and the logical positivist argued that our scientific theories must be falsifiable. So we want to come up with explanations and theories where you could imagine that they could be tested, where there could be a chance that they could be wrong. After the fact explanations are meaningless in science. So we don't really like to come up with after the fact or post hoc explanations because in a way that's like confirmatory bias and saying like you knew it all along. So instead what we do is we try to formulate a theory, make a prediction, and then see if we can make a proper prediction that the prediction will actually come out true. And if yes, then our theory is supported and we understand the phenomenon. But if it's no, we know that our theory is not supported. So we may need to change our theory, or maybe we've just done a bad job of running our experiment. We need to go back and do it again. There are also bad hypotheses out there that you could write. Bad hypotheses are, for instance, circular ones where you don't really ever say anything come up with a really good explanation for anything. So they're just simply renaming the phenomenon without providing any additional information. You could say things like the global economic crisis was brought about by mass economic panic. And then you could say, where does mass economic panic come from? It comes from the global economic crisis, right? So it doesn't really explain anything, a circular hypothesis. You could also have hypotheses that contain non-scientific ideas or forces. This would be getting into, again, things like metaphysics or coming up with soul or some sort of phenomenon that we can't possibly ever measure. And so that would be a bad hypothesis. That would be something that wasn't materialistic. And then hypotheses could often contain ill-defined terms, things that are not, they don't have good operational definitions. They're just too vague. And so and you could say things like uh, distractibility is something that you're interested in. If you don't really define what it means to be distractible, it's too vague, then you're not going to have a really good hypothesis. So you need to have good, clear operational definitions of whatever the terms are. So good theories then are falsifiable. They're not circular. They don't contain non-scientific ideas or forces. 
and they contain precise definitions of the associated terms and concepts. Another thing about good theories is that they tend to be parsimonious. And that is, if we've got two theories for the same phenomenon and one theory is simpler than the other theory, we prefer the simpler theory. So a theory, two theories might be equally good at explaining the phenomenon, but parsimony is this idea that we like to have a theory that is the simplest explanation. That's what it means to be parsimonious. So as we move to this course, the last thing I'd like to do today is introduce four pillars of this course, four aspects about research methods and statistics that will be something that we come back again and again to throughout the semester. So the four pillars I'm going to call are hypothesis testing, sample size, power, and effect size. All right. So these are the four pillars, four things that if there's anything else you're going to take from this entire course this semester, you understand what these four things are. Okay. So number one, hypothesis testing. This is this thing I keep bringing up where we're going to turn, learn how to set up the null and the alternative hypothesis. And then we're going to collect our data and then we're going to evaluate the statistics. And then we're going to decide whether or not the finding that we got was rare enough to reject the null hypothesis. And this is where you hear about P less than 0.05. So you've heard about this before in psychology articles, P less than 0.05 is really important. This is when we're deciding to reject the null hypothesis. So obviously, pillar number one is something that you're going to learn a lot about over the next few weeks and something you're going to need to master. The second important pillar is what's called sample size. And this is the number of participants in your study. Now, when we run a study, we need to figure out how many participants we're going to, to test. And the question then is, what determines this number? How many participants should you actually have in your study? And partly this is going to be determined by our resources, whether or not we have funding from a grant. Can we pay for our participants? Are they plentiful? And whatever guidelines we have in research that tells us about this number. Number three is going to be power. And this is our statistical ability to correctly reject the null hypothesis. You want to have as much of this ability as possible. So we try to increase our statistical power as much as we can. So that third pillar is called power or statistical power, the ability to correctly reject the null hypothesis. Again, you'll learn more about power and we'll come back to it again and again over the next 12 weeks. This is an important pillar that we'll bring up many times. And number four, the fourth thing I'd like you to be able to take away from this course is what's known as the effect size. And the effect size is how much of an effect does your manipulated variable have in your study? So when you manipulate your independent variable, like how hungry the rat is, or how many bystanders are standing by, is this effect behavior in a small amount of way, a medium way, or a large effect? And how do you know whether it's large? So the effect size is going to be our fourth important pillar that we're going to need to master. So far, what we've talked about in this first lecture is we've talked about how the scientific method is the preferred way of knowing. There's all these alternative ways, but the scientific method is the way we're going to be doing things here. I've talked about what the principles of science are, the goals of science, the scientific process, how it works, and how we're going to evaluate hypotheses and theories. So this is our good opening to give us a general sense of where we're going with science. Next week, what we'll be doing is talking more about some of these research methods and specifically how we do experiments.